This is then said Hushai onto Zadok and to Abiata the priest. Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus, has, and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. Now Jonathan and Ahimez stayed by Enrogel, for they might not be seen to come into the city. And the wench went and told them, and they went and told King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but they went both of them away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim, which had a well in his court, whither they went down. And the woman took and, co- and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground corn thereon, and the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman, to the house, they said, Where is Ahimez and Jonathan? And the woman said unto them, They be gone over the brook of water, and when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. And it came to pass after they were departed that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly over the water, for thus had Ahithophel counsel against you. Then David arose and all the people that were with him, and they passed over Jordan by the morning light that lacked not one of them that was not gone over Jordan. All right, and may God bless to us uh, the reading of his word. Let's uh, pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, even uh, for this evening and for the reading of your word. And Lord, uh, I pray that you just bless your word and the teaching and the preaching thereof. Uh, empower me, use me also as your instrument. And Lord, uh, I just pray and ask that um, just use it Lord, to strengthen us and uh, Lord, to give us strong encouragement. And we thank you for what you're about to do. And we ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Okay. And we're gonna tonight. We're gonna look at um, okay this these passages of scripture, and I'm gonna talk about the downfall of the proud. Right? We saw how uh, last week, right? Two men in particular, very um, proud of their you know their achievements or their uh, their attributes. Right? Uh, you know, Absalom because of his uh, great physical beauty, right, as a man, and then uh, and then his the beauty even of his hair. Right, it was so thick and luscious, and you know, uh, and so full. Right, a full head of hair, and then a hairfutel. Uh, you know that so much so that um, if you were to seek counsel from him, the advice that he gives you, it was said to be like the equivalent of uh, having sat down to uh consult with God, and you know, God having given you an answer uh concerning your questions. All right, and so. Um, and we saw how in the last uh, lesson, right, that the problem with uh, pride and ego is that, you know, there can only be room for one. Okay, putting them all in together uh, in the same room, whatever, is not going to work, right? And uh, Hifotel, uh came up with a scheme to uh, go after David and uh, using very limited, um, okay, resources and, and, and force, um, the whole operation centered around him and uh, you know and what he's going to do and how he's going to actually bring uh, you know just bring back you know David and kill, uh, kill him and then bring him back um, compared to then Ushai who actually came up with a different counsel right different plan and proposal which uh, was designed to inflate and make uh, Absalom look really really good and you know the problem is that um you know, when you got pride, it, it grows like a balloon, right? It expands to fill up all available space and there can be room for only one, right? And so what happened was uh, the council of uh, Ahithotel was rejected, right? Uh, not because it was a bad plan, but uh, that Hushai's plan was better, right? It was better, it uh, massaged every, uh, you know, uh, uh, Absalom's pride, you know, uh, he saw how he could come out looking uh, like a big hero as a result of it. So uh, they went with that plan, right? So now the thing is this. Um, the wheels are already turning, right? What is set, what's set in motion now is the eventual downfall of men like Ahithotel and also Absalom. And tonight we're going to see the downfall of, uh, of Ahithotel, okay? And so 
we begin uh, firstly with Hushai's communication. Now look at verse uh, 16, right? Or chapter 17. So then said Hushai unto Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, right? Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now, so Hushai came to Zadok and Abiathar. Now he gives them the details, right? It says, these are the things that Ahithophel counseled, and that's what he said. And then here is my counsel, right? Which was um, designed uh, uh, by Hushai to overturn the counsel of, of uh, okay, or uh, Ahithotel. Now, up to this point, it looks like, yes, uh, Absalom uh, seems to have bought in, bought in and uh, into this whole idea of uh, Hushai, right? Whatever he's proposed. And it looks like he's going to go with it. But you will see here that uh, Hushai actually lays out both plans, all right? And he wants this to be communicated, right? Uh, so he communicates this to Zadok and Abiathar and he wants this to be relayed to David so that David knows about, okay, what uh, Ahithotel had proposed and what he counter-proposed and, you know, what looks like, uh, you know, it's going to happen. Now, you're going to find, you're going to see here that uh, in the, okay, in where there is uh, warfare, okay, and uh, and whenever there's warfare, okay, what one of the things that's going to happen is this: that people um, having intelligence, right? In other words, knowing what the other side is doing is very very important. Okay, uh, knowing the plans of the enemy, be, being able to read today, for instance, their messages. Uh, listening on their communications, right? Uh, to be able to see their email, for instance, uh, all these things are important, okay? And here, now, um, what okay, Husha is doing is he's giving David a glimpse into the entire war conference, right, that was going on and what's, how it transpired and, and so what uh, Absalom and, you know, Ahifotel, all these people are thinking, all right? So that was, uh, sorry, uh, that was in verse 15. And so what we see now in verse 16 is the counsel, okay, based on the things that have happened, right? Hushai now gives counsel and uh, advice to David in verse 16. So said, now therefore send quickly and tell David, right? So he tells uh, Zadok and Abiathar, right? You need to transmit this message very quickly. Let David know, okay? They are all playing different roles in uh, how they help uh, uh, David, right? And Hushai has done his part. Now he's passing the ball now to uh, okay, Zedok and uh, Abaita. And he says, okay, quickly let David know. He says, saying, lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over. All right? He says, do not remain in the plains of the wilderness. All right? The, now, David is not very far away from Jerusalem. Right? He's hiding. His men are there, but Okay, they're not very far from Jerusalem. And he says, don't remain there. He says, but speedily pass over. The point is, pass over, cross over the River Jordan because that is um, in, in the area uh, around Israel. Now, that is a very major physical barrier. Right? He says, pass over. Now, there's a reason for that. He says, lest the king be swallowed up. Okay, and all the people that are with him. So, the point he's making here is that Passover, don't remain there, okay? Because based on uh, Ahithotel's plan, okay, assuming, now he's, assu Husha is assuming one thing, okay, that there is a possibility Absalom may actually still follow Ahithotel's plan, okay? Um, he may have said, okay, uh, that, you know, Husha's plan is better, so on and so forth, okay? As to what he is actually going to do, now Hushai has no idea. Now there is the possibility that Absalom still doesn't trust Hushai. All right. And so any communication, anything that he's said, right, any indication that he is likely to follow Hushai's plan could be a ploy to flush him out as an infiltrator, as a you know, as an agent working for David. Um so he but so he told uh David, right? The message was this, don't remain where you are. Don't remain in the plains. Pass over across, across the Jordan River. Okay, it says, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him, right? So 
just in case, okay, that uh, if, uh, that Absalom and his forces overrun David. Now, in his counter proposal and plan, it was designed to slow Absalom down, right, to buy time for David, so that David has time to continue to amass his forces, and uh, you know, as news gets out throughout the kingdom, right, people are going to choose which side they are on. All right, and some are going to uh, come out towards David, looking for him to join up with him. Now, but there is a danger that Absalom may have told Hushai, yeah, your plan is better, we're going to go with your plan, but he actually still uh, is actually sticking with Ahithotel's plan, right? Because Hushai is still under suspicion. So he sends this very uh, cautionary message to David to say, just in case, Right. Either way, cross over. Don't remain where you are. You there is a danger of being overrun. Okay. So you will see here that um, now in the original plan, right? David had sent Hushai back to Jerusalem, right? In chapter fifteen, verse thirty-five, and he said this: "And has thou not there with the Zadok and uh, Abita the priest?" Okay. So he, when he sent Hushai back. Right to play this role. Now uh, he says, "Okay, there's Zadok and Abita the priest." It says, "Therefore it shall be that what thing soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abita the priest." Now, uh, so this was the role that they were going to play. Hushai will play the uh, one to counter the counsel of Ahithophel, but he will relay the information, um, intelligence over to. Zadok and Abita, and they are going to be the ones that will relate to David. Okay, so this was the arrangement. This was the, the respective roles that they were supposed to play. And then um, look at verse 36. David tells uh, Hush Hushai, right? He said, Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimez, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them ye shall send unto me everything that ye can hear. All right? So it's true, these two, right, the sons of uh, Zadok and Abaita, um, they are going to be the ones to relay the message. Now, very obviously, Zadok and Abaita being the priests, now they cannot be seen to be um, as the, you know, in their senior positions. Now, they cannot be seen to be uh, disappearing, running back and forth, because uh, it will attract too much suspicion. On the other hand, um, you know, it can be fully expected that you know, their sons may be running errands for their fathers and all that. So uh, if they were to be seen or, okay, going around somewhere, it's not going to arouse the kind of suspicion uh, compared to you know, um, Abaita and Zadok. Okay? So their sons are going to be the ones to relay the message directly to David. Now, so they were brief about what was happening. There was a warning. Okay? And then there was a danger, right, of being overrun by Absalom and his people unless he crosses the Jordan River over to the other side. Okay, so um, now there's a question that we may ask is this, should the priests, right, uh, have been involved in all this, right? Some will, will argue that, okay, well, these are political matters, right? Uh, so should the priests be involved? Now, it's very clear Right, the, these priests, they were not neutral. Why? Because they were standing with what was right rather than, uh, it, it wasn't a question of whose side they're on, all right? Or which is the winning, uh, you know, which is the winning side and, and so on and so forth. But rather, what was the right thing to do? And they stood with the Lord and they stood with God's anointed. And that's the most important part, right? If they're standing with the Lord's anointed, now, who is that? It's still David, right? God has not replaced David, right? Uh, he is still the Lord's anointed. And they were, so because of that, they were unafraid and bold because this was not based on things that pertain to men. You see, um, even in teaching and preaching right now, it's one thing I'm telling you my opinions, you know, my, my thoughts and my opinions. It's another thing when uh, it is the word of God. Why? Because with the word of God, you know, we have every confidence uh, to stand and to declare it boldly. Because why? It's not my thoughts. I'm now if it's my opinion, my ideas, my plans, now there is still the possibility of being wrong. Okay? But when it comes to what God has declared, you know, that's not an issue. 
Okay, there's no, it's not even a question, you know, about whether it's wrong or not, or there's a possibility of being wrong. All right, God's word is always, you know, going to be there. It's going to be true. All right, uh, his principles, okay, are correct. And so, now these priests they stood with what the God has not replaced the king. Okay, there may be a coup that's going on right now. All right, there's all this upheaval. God has not indicated in any way that he was done with David. And so they stood with David because they were standing with what is right. Okay. Um, now, many people may say, okay, well, you know, the, the priests, right? They're supposed to be neutral. Now, when it comes to a matter of right or wrong, there is no such thing as being neutral. Right? You stand with what is right, period. Okay. Unless you, you unless in the first place, you are standing on political ground. Otherwise, you don't stand on politics. We stand also not on personality. Right? What do we do? We stand on spiritual principle. Those things don't change. And because those things don't change, okay, we, our loyalty is always towards what is right, towards uh, the Lord, right, towards His principles, towards His word. And if all that falls on one side rather than the other, then we, we take that side. It's very simple. Okay? But the problem today is because so much revolves around politics, right? And personalities. What happens? Uh, we've got the people are uh, trying, even pastors and all that, all that right? Uh, are trying to look like, okay, we want to look like, we you know, we are being fair and neutral. As I said, there is no such thing as fair and neutral when it comes to right or wrong. Okay, the question is this, are you going to stand with what is right? And if you're not, then why? Okay, and so we realize this, right? The priests wanted to do what's right. They have a mandate from God and, to, and an obligation to actually stand on what is right. And so that was why they did what they did. Now, the other question would be this, but David, you know, did this, David did that, you know, you know he, uh, did he do wrong? Yes. Right? David was not sinlessly perfect. Neither were the priests. Okay? Every priest, including the high priest, will have to make an offering for their own sins, right? Before they can enter even into the holiest of the holies. Why? Because they were not sinlessly perfect. Okay? Uh, there is only one priest, all right? One great high priest that is sinlessly perfect, and that is Jesus Christ. Okay? None of that ought to stop us, right, from doing what is right and standing on what is right. Okay? And so, um, hang on. And so, realize, okay, the next thing, we see the concealment of the men because they now go out to try to bring the message to David. Right? Look at verse 17. Now, Jonathan and Ahimez stayed by Enrogel. Okay? We see the sons of uh, Abaita, right, and uh, Zadok. Now, they were not there in Jerusalem. Okay, they stayed at a place called Enrogo, therefore, they might not be seen to come into the city, right? So, because they did not want to be seen coming in and out of the city of Jerusalem. So, another from their fathers, okay, from Hushai to the priest. Right, from the priest. Now they sent a messenger. It says, and a wench went and told them, right? So this is females, uh, this is a female servant. You know, this was a servant girl, right? She went and says and told them. She relayed the information, right? This message. Why? Because again, um, even Jonathan and Ahimez moving in and out of the city would attract attention. So just an ordinary servant girl went and told them the message, right? Uh where, why? Because uh, she's not likely to attract attention. And they went and told King David. Okay, so they stayed at this place called Enrogel. Right? It's called. Uh, it's also known as the Mount, the Fount of the Fuller. Now, this is a spring that is near Jerusalem, right? Uh, which is on the border, right, of uh, Judah and Benjamin. Okay, the the territory between marking uh, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Right, it's just right on the border. Um, it's also the permanent water source of the pool of Siloam. Okay, now this message to Jonathan, as I mentioned, was uh, relayed by this servant girl, right, to avoid suspicion. Okay, so 
I want to note one thing here. You're going to see, you know, you don't have to be someone, let's say, blessed with a great uh, wisdom and intelligence. For instance, like Hu Shai, who can counter uh, a Hifotel, right, to be used of the Lord. Uh, you don't have to be a priest, right, uh, like Zadok and Abaita to be used of the Lord. Now, you don't even have to be the son, right, of the priest. Okay, just this servant girl, right? She is nobody, right? Nobody famous. In the scriptures, we don't even, right? No, she goes down in history and in the scriptures and nobody knows her name, right? And yet she carried this all important message, right? That uh, would have, you know, would uh, this information would save the lives of David and all his people, and if she failed in that mission, all was lost. And yet you see this great and heavy responsibility, right? Being placed on the shoulders of just an ordinary person and realizes God can use anybody, including you and I. Okay? We don't, we, you know, so we, what we have to do is quit imagining that, oh, I need to be somebody, I need to be like this, or I need to be like that. Okay? All was needed for this girl was that she was willing Right, and you know that she actually obeyed. She just did it, okay. And 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 so in in just doing our part, taking up our role, you know, God can use us already in a great and mighty way. Now, unfortunately, when this message was relayed to them, now they were spotted, and and so this uh, news of this uh, went on to actually uh, to Absalom. Right? Okay, verse eighteen. Nevertheless, a lad saw them. Okay, so they were spotted says, and told Absalom, but they went both of their way, uh, both of them aw awake quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim, which had a well in his court, whither they went down, right? So they went to uh, Bahurim. They found uh, a man uh, that had a well in his court. And what did they do? They went into the well to hide, right? They, they actually descended into the well and, and they tried to so that they were not spotted. Okay. Now, if we look at the map, you're going to see, okay, Jerusalem is on the map. But if you look at the, where the pin is, uh, okay, where the pin is marked here, okay, that's in Rogel. Okay. That's the place where they were. So they're not very far away from Jerusalem, actually. Okay. Now, they went to Bahurim, uh, which incidentally was uh, the hometown of Shimei. Right. Do you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5? Right, it says, and when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. Right, and yeah, he came forth and cursed still as he came. Right, this was the place. Right, as when David was passing, what happens? Shimei came out. Uh, right, and went walked uh, ran alongside with uh, David and his men and started uh, you know, throwing up dust. Right, throwing stones and then hurling insults at David and all that. Okay, all these things happen in Bahurim. Now, so the these two young men, right, are there and they're hiding right now because right, um they know, okay, that Absalom and his men are coming for them, uh looking for them and they need to hide. Right. And so <clears throat> they found concealment in the well. Now not only did they find concealment, they also found a comrade right uh, there who helped them. Look at verse 19. And the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground corn thereon, and the thing was not known. Okay, and so what happened was this. Um, while they were hiding in the well, now this woman, to make it more convincing, what she did was she put a covering over the mouth of the well. Right, So she covered this whole top and then what happened? The corn that was ground, she laid it out there as if she's drying it, right? Uh, overnight. Okay. She's air drying this. And so it basically concealed the fact that um, there was a well and there, uh, there were men, possibly that men were hiding underneath. So it tells us here, it says, and the thing was not known. So nobody knew about it, right? Uh, they, it was hidden. And you'll see again, uh, examples of over and over again on the ground, ordinary people, right? Also taking taking sides, right? Taking up uh okay, the to 
stepping up to the defense of David, right? Um, helping him in, in what small way that they can. Okay, now you will see. Um, can, can this woman like take up a sword and go to battle? No, she can't. Or can she put the covering and then hide the fact that conceal the you know the uh the existence of these men yes she can right and so she became uh not only a comrade right she was a co-conspirator in helping these men to be able to relay this uh, very important right message uh over to david oh we're gonna see over and over again uh, in the scriptures of examples where uh, there are cases of civil disobedience, right? Where uh, what happens is that where there is a wicked king or a or, or wicked law, right? And that violates uh, God's laws. Now you're going to see uh, God's people would put God's laws, what is right, ahead of all these things. Okay? In other words, um, even the law of the land now is not absolute because what happens God's laws and principles are higher, right? And where there is a conflict or what seems to be a conflict, however, uh, the answer is very, very clear. We obey God rather than men. Now, we see this uh, example in Exodus chapter 1, right, verse 22. It says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, he shall cast into the river, and every daughter he shall save alive. Now, what happened was this. Um, there was an order from Pharaoh Okay, uh, to all the people and then also to the Hebrew midwives, right? That when um, the Hebrew women uh, were about to give birth, they go into labor. Now, what happens is this? It says when they deliver a child, it says every male, right? According to verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, every male that is born, okay, will be thrown into the river now uh, to be eaten by the crocodiles alive. But it says they will save all the daughters, right? All the girls, why? Right? Because uh, they serve many purposes. They can still be servants. They can be, still be concubines. They can be whatever, uh, you know. What, but the risk was this. Every male uh, poses a risk or danger to their national security. So they wanted all of them to be killed. Now look at chapter 2, verse 2. Okay, and, the, and so... Um, because what happened was this uh, in Exodus chapter let me let me just bring up that verse because I think I, I missed out one uh, passage here okay ah alright look at verse 20 and verse uh, chapter 1 verse 20 and verse 21 okay it says therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the women and the people multiplied and worked very mighty and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Now, what happened was is the Pharaoh actually um, gave an order that all the midwives were to, if they deliver a male child, what did they do? They were to kill it. All right. But instead, they actually uh, did not comply. Okay. And when asked about this, they, the midwives actually told Pharaoh, well, you know, it says, uh, you know, the Hebrew women, they're not like the Egyptian women, right? They're very lively. They're, they're very healthy, very strong. Okay. So by the time we arrived there to deliver the baby, the baby already popped out. Um, you know, we, we had no opportunity to kill them, right? And and so we couldn't do anything about it. Okay. And so that, that was kind of the excuse that they gave, right? And um to be even without lying, all they needed to do was this. Whenever a child was uh, to be born now, they just had to like, drag their feet, take their time. And by the time they arrive, not the baby's out already. Okay. And so, um, so they technically could do this uh, with, you know, with, uh, as a form of non-compliance. Now look at Exodus 2 verse uh, 2, because now the order was that every child that is born will be cast into the river. Now, here we see, and it says, and the woman conceived, right? Uh, okay. This is the mother of uh, Moses. And bear a son, and when she saw uh, him that, that he was a goodly child, okay, she hid him three months. Okay, so instead of what uh, throwing him into the, the river, what happens? Uh, she kept him, right? Uh, hid him for three months uh, instead of um, you know feeding him to the crocodiles. Okay, now the law says that she, if this should happen, now she would have to voluntarily surrender her son. 
in order to be eaten by, by the crocodiles. But what she did instead was to defy that law because it was wrong and then to hide him for three months. Okay? And verse 3 tells us, and when she could not hide him, she took him for uh, took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Okay, so Exodus 2 verse 3 uh, points out another thing here that uh, when she could no longer hide the child, what happens? Again, the, she is in danger of breaking the law. Now, the law says every child you must cast into the river. Okay, but the law did not say anything about putting casting the child into the river with a flotation device. And so what she did was this. She made an ark that could float, right? It was waterproof. She put, put him in there. She laid him in the river, right? Now, he, he, the law didn't say how far out into the river to go. So she just put him by the brink, right? By the bank of the river. Okay. Now, she, did she comply with the law? Yes. Okay. But what happens was this. In doing so, God worked out a way uh, where her son, right, Moses, could be saved and he grew up to become the, uh, was taken care of and become the, okay, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we see um, our third part, right, the confusion of the searches, right? Now, the, a search party was sent out to look for these men, right? In verse 20, it says, and when Absalom's servants came to the woman, uh, to the house, they said, where is Ahimez and Jonathan now? So you can see from here that by the fact that they actually called them by name, right? Uh, they knew, okay, that uh, Ahimez and Jonathan were there, right? They're looking for them. Uh, so they came searching and they're asking, where, where are they now, right? Reveal the information to us. It says, and the woman said to them, they be gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Now, so what did she do? Okay. She gave them uh, misleading information, right? She told them, and said, okay, they're gone. Okay. They were here earlier, but they were gone. And uh, now they actually went across the brook. Okay. And so they went in that direction, searching for them. And, uh, and so here it says they could not find them. They just returned and went back to Jerusalem. Okay. So, she seeded uh, confusion, right, such that uh, they were unable to find them. And then look at verse 21. And it came to pass after they were departed that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly over the water, for thus had a hotel counsel against you. Okay, so they went quickly to search for David and then to relay the message. And they told him, right, quickly pass over the water, uh, referring to crossing over the Jordan River. All right, it says, for thus had, notice, a Hephotel counsel against you. Now, the fact that the, this verse actually points out, right, this uh, to actually home in on what the uh, counsel or a Hephotel was, okay, I think goes on to further underline, right, that as long as, uh, okay, as long as uh, this situation is concerned, there is still the ongoing danger that Absalom could change his mind and he could use the council of Hivotel. So either case, to be safe, what they did was uh, to now was time, the time for David to take action uh, to counter what Hivotel would have done. Okay. Um, Hivotel would have, uh, his plan was what? To send a team, right? About 10,000, right? Overnight, come in swiftly, uh, stealthily, and then to take David and to finish him off. Right? So, uh, David was now going to run and relocate so that he cannot be found. Okay. Now, you're going to see uh, where there is a war going on, weapons, um, camouflage, um, misinformation, all these things are used very often right, and as legitimate tools, okay, or weapons uh, against the enemy. Okay. And, and you're going to see... Um, Things like camouflage, right? Misinformation. Now, all these things are fair game, and uh, hence they, right? Uh, I think that the saying is that all's well, all's fair in love and war. Now, you're gonna see, uh, as far as war is concerned, okay, the rules are there aren't many rules, okay. Of course, today in our modern warfare, we do have rules, but even then, you see nations break them all the time. 
Okay, even like right now by Russia. Um, now what happens is this. Okay, they are. Uh, okay, they were misled. Okay, the uh, Absalom and his people are probably going to be um, were delayed, but because the news leaks out, right, that um, Jonathan and Ahimez know about, okay, uh, uh, Absalom knows that Jonathan and Ahimez are going to relay that information to David. There is no more guarantee that Hushai's plan will be adopted. Okay? There's no more guarantee that uh, they will, you know, there is every reason to believe in others that Hushai is a double agent. And so, this would mean that Absalom could still go back to a Hifotel's plan. Uh, so, which is why, what you're going to see here, the focus on what had a Hifotel counsel against David and they are making sure that uh, they can counter his plan, all right, and um, they can frustrate him. Otherwise, uh, David would be in very, very deep and serious trouble. Now, you're going to see in Joshua chapter 2, verse uh, 3 and 4, okay, uh, same thing, the mis mis misleading information uh, okay, was seeded. Okay, it says here, it says, and the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the city. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, uh, there came men unto me, but I wist not where they were. All right, so she actually hides the men and then, um, okay, and then after that, um, basically passes uh, false information to the king of Jericho. Now, I mentioned earlier on in Exodus uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, how God dealt very well with the Hebrew midwives because, again, they feared, here in verse 21 it says, because the midwives feared God that he made them houses, right? And, and so they did not comply uh, with uh, this unlawful and wicked law and order by um, Pharaoh and they decided that uh, they were not going to kill Right, these are Hebrew babies. Okay. The, and you're going to notice something here. Right? God has been very consistent in the scriptures. The killing of babies is a very, very wicked and vile thing. Okay. Now, so what happens? God honored the Hebrew midwives for what they've done. All right. And for their act of civil disobedience. Okay. Now, having said that, this, this is not an easy thing to do. Okay, and it does require wisdom because uh, we are commanded also to obey right, the civil authorities. But where there is a uh, conflict, in other words, there is a dilemma, we ought to be very clear which side we choose. Because look at Acts 5 verse 28 to 29, saying, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? Right? So the Jewish authorities had, uh, commanded the uh, the. Okay, the disciples, right? It says that they should not teach and preach in the name of Jesus. It says, And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Right? It says, no, you know, you got filled all of Jerusalem with uh, your teachings and your doctrines, right? Uh, of Christ. And then it says, and then uh, you got to hold us accountable and guilty for killing him. Okay? Which... You will see in the book of Acts uh, a number of these uh, sermons that were preached, right? Whether it's by Stephen or by Peter and all that, they held the Jewish authorities, right? Uh, the Jews guilty and accountable for the death of Jesus, right? For putting okay him to death, even though he was innocent of all charges. Now we look at verse twenty nine. The response of Peter and the apostles, right? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, "We ought to obey God rather than men." Okay. This was not even up for debate, however, right? Obeying God comes first over and above everything else, right? If there is a contradiction, if there is a clash, if there is a conflict, we obey God. Very simple. Okay? Otherwise, uh, you know, if the laws are just, if the laws are good, we obey them. There's no problem at all. But where the law de requires us to disobey God, now that's a different story. Okay? It's not about, okay, well, you know, this is uh, not a Christian nation, so I don't obey the laws. No, that's not what the Bible says. 
Okay, all law, right? Now, regardless of whether it was uh, secular or even pagan, right? The rulers are pagan. We obey unless, right? We're, we are required to di directly disobey God, uh, you know, in having to, in trying to obey men. Okay, and so the context of uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29 is that where we have to choose is very clear. God comes first. Okay, so look at uh, now point number four, the communicate to David. Now, the warning was related to David. All right, look at chapter 17, verse 21. And it came to pass after they were departed that they came up out of the well and went and took King David and notice, and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly over the water. For thus, thus that a, a, a hivotel counseled against you, All right? So, um, now the advice to David was to act quickly. Okay, getting the information is one thing. You can, you and I can have all the information, all right? But unless we act on the information, unless we believe the information that is given to us, right? Unless we take it seriously, what happens? It does absolutely nothing. Information cannot save your life, okay? It's only when you act upon the information that something can be done. Now, the same thing is that you and I, right? And I speak to many, maybe uh, even the young people. You know, you've grown up all your life being in church. You know, you heard the gospel. You, you know a lot about the Bible. Now, knowing about the Bible, knowing the word of God is not enough, all right? Because in there, even the gospel contains instructions, right? Contains a warning. And then it contains also a promise that can be applicable to us if we were to take it seriously, to take heed and act on it, right? And unless we act on that, okay? We say to flee from the wrath to come, right? To flee to uh, God the Father, right? To confess, to repent towards God and then to put our faith, right, to uh, entrust in the finished work of Christ. Okay, to, unless you act on that, you know, that information does nothing. Okay? And so, realize, you can have all the information, you can know where all the fire extinguishers are located in the building, but unless you actually act on that, use the information, it's not going to help you if there's a fire. You actually have to go there, act on the information, the instructions, you know, and put it to use. Okay, so just mere knowledge is insufficient. Now here, David has to now act on the information. Otherwise, he and his men stand to lose their lives. Now look at verse 22, right? So David arose, says, then David arose and all the people that were with him, and they passed over Jordan, right? They crossed over the river Jordan. They went all all through the night, it says, and by the morning light, there lacked not one of them that was not gone over Jordan. So by the morning, at, at dawn, everyone had already crossed over. No man was left behind, right? Because David acted on the information and he acted swiftly, right? Uh, he didn't dilly-dally. Uh, you contrast that to Lot, right? In, in, the, in the book of Genesis. Now, even though, he knows about the overthrow and the destruction of the city of Sodom. What happens? He was still, you know, fiddling around, you know, pottering around in the house or whatever until the angels had to literally take him and his wife by the hand and drag them out of the house. Why? Because time was up. Okay. Now, David, you see, uh, acted on the information and along with his, uh, the people that were with him, right? And they acted swiftly. And so because of that, by morning, right? Nobody was left behind on the other side and they were all safe and sound. Okay? So, not only that, you're going to see, uh, you see that David, just like Jesus, now acted to ensure the safety, right, of his people. Now, John 18, verse 8 and 9, you'll see this is the heart of a shepherd, right? Just, just like David, right? The, uh, was the shepherd of God's people in Israel, right? Uh, Jesus uh, towards his uh, disciples, right? Uh, it was all about their yeah, peace and safety, right? John 18, verse 8 and 9 said, and Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, right? Uh, this was when uh, the night in which uh, he was betrayed and they, uh, was, they were about to arrest him. Now it says, if therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, right? Now he's negotiating on behalf of his disciples. Right? He says, look, 
if you're here to seek me, you're here to arrest me, right? Take me. But it says, but let them go. Okay? He, he's telling the, the, all these people that came to arrest him, right? To let his disciples go because they have nothing to do with this. It says, notice verse 9. It says that the saying might be fulfilled. And this was a fulfillment of scripture or prophecy, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I, have I lost none. Okay? Um, none would lose their lives that night. Okay, uh, they, okay, nothing would happen to them because right, Jesus put their safety and well-being right ahead of his. Okay, and that was his heart towards uh, okay, his disciples. Now we see that uh, this relaying of information, right? Uh, even uh, in the book of Acts, you see that uh, Paul's nephew right relayed information about a possible danger and possible risk to Paul's life uh, in order that his life could be saved. Now look at Acts 23, verse 16 and 17. And when Paul's sister's son, right, heard of their lying in wait, right? So he, he heard about this group of people who were sworn that they were going to ambush uh, Paul and kill him, right? He says, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Verse 17, then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he had a certain thing to tell him. And so um, he relayed this information, right? That there was going to, there was a planned ambush and attack and uh, it was going to happen. And so uh, this was relayed to the Roman authorities, the soldiers who then uh, get, decided that they were going to safeguard Paul and uh, they will bring a, a whole detachment of soldiers um, to ask, escort him and to bring him okay, away from Jerusalem. Now, so we see all this is happening. Now, in other words, what David has done in crossing over now has made it more difficult, even if Absalom was to now switch over to Ahithophel's plan. What happens? It's too late. They've lost the element of surprise. Okay? And you can see some uh, many times is that um, having a good plan is one thing, but making sure that you maintain the initiative right and that the, you keep the element of surprise uh, is very very important and it's a very big part of the plan that's why a Hifotel's plan uh, was all based on stealth and speed but now they've lost both of those things okay everything now uh, is gone to waste even if Absalom was now to switch over to a Hifotel's plan it's too late okay it's not going to help them it's not going to change the situation and so we see uh, uh, point five here, the crushing blow to Ahithotel, right? Because the rejection of Ahithotel's counsel, right, came as a very crushing blow to him. Okay, look at verse 23. And when Ahithotel saw that his counsel was not followed, what did he do? He sat, saddled his ass and arose and get him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself, and died, and was buried in the sepulchre of his father. Now, you will see a picture here of uh, how dejected, right? How uh, discouraged a hotel was. Because <coughs> at this point, moment he saw that his counsel was not followed by Absalom, he realized basically, right, to kind of sum it up, it was game over. You see that, you know, at this point, he it's the equivalent of a Hifotel just quietly packing up all his toys, putting them all in this bag, and then he's just going home. It's very sad, right? He settles his ass, right? He rides it home, right? Uh, goes back to his hometown, okay? And then what happens? He, you know, he makes sure that everything in his household, you know, is settled, right? Puts all his, fine, his affairs in order, Right, this is his final act, and then he hangs himself. Okay, and he died. Why? Because the game was over. The, the the war was over. No, this should not be a surprise to us because uh Second Samuel chapter fifteen verse thirty one. We already saw that David had prayed and asked God to overturn the council of Ahithotel, once he knew that Ahithotel 
was one of the conspirators, right? It says, and one told David saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, Lord, oh Lord, I pray thee. Okay. Now you notice this is not very big formula or, or strict formula to the prayer. He's at this point, right? When he heard the news, David just calls out to the Lord. He says, oh Lord, I pray thee. It turned the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And what do we see? Here was the fulfillment, right, of that uh, of that prayer, because God honored that God had used Hushai to overturn, right, the counsel of Ahithophel. Ahithophel realizes what has happened to, right, and that um, all the good that uh, all that he was trying to do uh, to help uh, Absalom, right, to come into rise up into power and all that. Uh, to take their revenge on David. Now, all that has now turned upside down. Okay? And so, God has answered David's prayer, all right? Overturned Ahithotel's counsel, and then, in that final realization, what happens? Ahithotel decides there's nothing else he could do. He hangs himself. Okay? Now, I think you and I realize this, right? There's nothing worse. One of the worst feelings in the world is when people will not heed your advice even when you're right. And then what happens? They go on to just um, do it anyway, right? And then things happen. And to make it worse, sometimes they come back to you and they blame you. Why didn't you tell me? Is it? But I already told you. I already warned you. But they will blame you anyway for it. Right? Now, Ahithotel knew that the, they had lost this war before even starting. The moment his advice was not taken concerning how to deal with David, right? They have given David a just a small amount of breathing space. And in that little gap, right, in the net, they had cast this net and imagine this little gap, he slips through. Okay? And from this point on, it's going to be very, very difficult for them. Right? And meantime, what's happened, right? Because of their pride, because of their ego, because of their... Uh, desire to, you know, try to do great things and then to be seen to be uh, accomplishing great things. What happens? Absalom and his forces were merrily charging into defeat. Right? They're charging straight into the jaws of defeat. And there was nothing that Ahithotel could do to change this. Right? Because God had overturned Ahithotel's words. Okay? And this awful sinking, frustrating feeling is now there with Ahithotel. He can't shake this off, right? He knows the whole whole battle is lost already, right? They lost the entire war. It wasn't just a battle anymore. That entire war was lost, right? Because they gave, uh, okay, Absalom and his men, right, gave David breathing room, okay? Instead of uh, ruthlessly, right, uh, swiftly, defeating him, killing him, okay? They allowed him just that little space to wiggle and that was all David needed. In fact, that was all God needed to get David out of that situation and then to now put him into a very different situation. Now, from here onwards, you're going to see that the rest, uh, as the battle plays out, right? The tables are now turned, okay? Just when uh, Absalom and you know, Ahithotel all thought that they have now an overwhelming victory and momentum and uh, numbers on their side. Okay? The coin now flips the other way. So, the problem, of course, is uh, with people who are stubborn, right? Uh, people who are foolish, uh, who will not listen, Right, who are so full of themselves, uh, it doesn't matter what you tell them, right? You can give them the best advice and uh, you can be very wise and they just are not going to listen, right? Because some people are just fooled, right? Spiritually, that's the way they are. Uh, spiritually, they are stubborn, right? Proverbs 26 verse 12, it says, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope, right? Right? Uh, here is more, there's more hope of a fool than of him. Okay? So, you know what? So you find a man who is wise in their own conceit. Okay? 
you were going to see there are people who okay sadly it could be a boss right it could be a parent and you know they go about life broadcasting the message to everyone that you know there's nobody wiser than them right that if they die the world is going to lose great wisdom and here, Proverbs 26, you know, they're so full of themselves. And when they're so full of their conceit, what happens? There's no hope for them. The situation is hopeless. It's pointless to argue, all right, for a hypothetical to argue with fools. Okay. Um, sometimes here's the problem. Okay. Some people are not going to see, see, and it's very sad sometimes. Uh, it's very diff frustrating because sometimes people are incapable of seeing what you can see, what you can see. All right. And if, they call on you for advice, okay? And the, 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 if there's one thing I hate is this, when people uh, turn, they come to you for advice, yet they come to you for advice only because they want you to rubber stamp whatever they already decided, right? They're not there to listen. Um, then what's the point of coming, me to, uh, coming to me for advice if you're not going to listen to what I say, okay? And, and obviously, you know, now, if you are someone who is known right consistently to uh be correct right to have good insight you know you you start to have confidence in uh you know that okay you don't just foolishly dish out advice no uh, but are people going to listen right because sometimes like here in the case of this kind of fool we can find ourselves just wasting our time wasting our breath and they just are not going to see it and is and so there's no hope for them Right, we see also just like Judas, a hypothetical after betraying, uh, okay, someone close to him. What did he do? He hanged himself. Right, Matthew twenty-seven verse four and five, saying, "I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood." Right, that's Judas uh, confessing that he had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the okay, the council, you know, look at what they said to him, right? And they said, "What is that to us?" See down to it, right? It says, it's not, that's none of our business. Okay, what's that got to do with us? It says, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, again, just like a hypothetical weapons, um, you see that, okay, now, is it possible men like a hypothetical or Judas, they make mistakes? Of course. All of us do. We make wrong decisions. Sometimes we make bad decisions some uh, whether it's out of anger right out of uh, a moment's foolishness but can there be a second chance can there be a recovery yes uh think about this right even in in the final chapters of matthew what happened peter denied the lord three times but can there be a turning around and forgiveness and restoration yes but what you can see with men like a hevertel and, and judas is you know um there's no moving on from there. They they are so perfect, right? They're so full of themselves that the only thing left is for them to hang themselves, right? Because um, to them, there is no recovery, okay, from this. And yet you're going to see with Christ and with the blood of Jesus Christ, there is always a recovery. There can be always be forgiveness. There can be a restoration. If only we will humble ourselves, okay? And that's probably the one thing that uh, both Ahithotel and uh, Judas could not do. Okay? To humble themselves. Now, oh. what do we see in the Psalms, right? Psalm 5, uh, 5 verse 10. You know, this is the psalmist crying out to God. It says, destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Right? You know, let them, uh, they're so smart, right? Let them uh, fall, right? Uh, be destroy themselves by their own counsels. They cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Okay? Psalm 55 verse 23, it says, But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out their half their days, but I will trust in thee. Okay? Here the psalmist calls out to God, you know, that God will bring them down to the pit of destruction. And here, Ahithotel is unable to recover from this whole thing, this setback, 
And yet, you what do you what do we see in contrast? David, over and over and over again, right? Setback after setback. What happens? By the grace of God, and by the through the strength of God, he bounces back. He bounces back. He bounces back. Right? Because you see, as a saint, right, with the help of God and with His grace, okay, there is always we can be very spiritually very resilient. Okay, we can. There, there can be grit, not because of our own perseverance, but by the help of God. Okay, we and our trust and our confidence in Him. What happens? We can keep coming back and coming back, coming back. Um, whereas in contrast, these men, right, who are so good, who are so intelligent, who are so smart, so wise, uh, or like um, Judas, right, so spiritually righteous. There is no recovery. Um, God can confound the wise. Okay? He can make all this human wisdom, right? And some people are so full of their own wisdom. God would God just knocks it aside. He, he, it's a small thing to him. Okay? Yet you and I need to be careful because right, when we look around, right? Sometimes what we see, we see the conceited, right? Uh, Men who are so full of their own wisdom, okay, and yet claiming, trying to dress it up to sound biblical, to sound spiritual. And yet God says he, he was going to destroy the wisdom of the prudent. Okay, much better for us to be regarded as fools, right, in the sight of other people, okay, and I would say even in, in the sight of even some people in church the worldly wise who happen to be wearing Christian clothing. Better to be seen by them as foolish and but embracing fully the wisdom of God through the word of God. Let them call you a fool. Right? Let them call us uh, you know, naive, or simplistic, right? Uh we see everything in black and white. But you know, much better that we are called names like that, but we trust, right, in the invisible God, who is all wise, right, and rather than to trust in the wisdom of man, okay, because the wisdom of man it's vain, right, it's empty. Now, as we close here, God is able to overturn the wisdom of the wise, right. Notice he uses ordinary people, right? They don't have to have power, intellect, or, or you know, special abilities or influence, and yet they can still be used in a very instrumental way. Example, that wench, right? That little servant girl, we don't even know her name. There was no description of her, okay? And yet, she, you know, she played a very pivotal part, right, in turning this whole historical situation around. Now, we're going to see obedience to God, right, and doing right comes before obedience to men. And as I mentioned just now, you know, the wisdom of God is far better, far more desirable, right, than men's wisdom. So as we close here, right, all this ought to point us to one thing, to place our hope, our faith, our trust, our confidence, not in uh, experts, not in doctors, right, or surgeons, not in uh, you know, all these financial experts or whatever, not in all these things, right, but in the true and living God, right, who is able to lead us and guide us, even when we don't know all the answers, yet he is able to direct us as to what is the right thing to do and what is the best decision to make, right, but we wrap up here, the question is this, will you take his hand Right, will you and I trust him? Or will you and I, you know, confess and admit we are limited in our knowledge and wisdom and but that we want him right to show us what to do, right? To give us all wisdom. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you even for this time in the word. Just thank you for uh 